Welcome and thank you all for logging on for session 10 of the Harvard GSD Alumni Council's Follow the Sun Symposium, which is called Future Forward, Accelerating the End of Homelessness, and takes the position of two of our panelists, primarily, Roseanne Haggerty and Neil Munslow, that homelessness or houselessness, whatever you want to call it, um, it's a solvable problem. And full disclosure, the first time I heard that particular assertion said in that exact way was uh, from Roseanne. So apologies to her if I've stolen a little bit of your presentation. Um, in any case, this panel will build on presentations that were made during the second volume of the Design Impact Series, which you can still see uh, uh, on the platform's website. That was held last November. Specific to this panel, we'll be delving into the work of both governmental and non-governmental organizations that are addressing the crisis at a variety of levels, starting with at the national scale, Richard Cho, who, Dr. Richard Cho, who oversees housing and homelessness efforts at, at, at HUD in the US. Then working primarily at the level of the city or cities, um, Roseanne Haggerty of Community Solutions, um, which just won a $100 million um, grant from the MacArthur, account, MacArthur Foundation to End Homelessness, and Neil Munslow of the city of Newcastle in the UK, similarly honored uh, by the UN. And finally, at a personal level, we'll be hearing from Sean Pleasance, an in independent activist in Los Angeles who has experienced homelessness firsthand. Um, throughout, we'll be learning about strategies that work. Uh, the efficacy of a systems approach that includes the use of data and feedback loops, the powerful results that come from public-private collaborations and information sharing, the importance of personal efforts and a personal touch, uh, whether governmental or non-governmental, and finally, the incredible effectiveness of preventive, er of, uh, preventive e efforts, all, while, um, all the while acknowledging the obvious, that is the urgent demand for supportive housing for those who are in need right now. With that, uh, I'm going to, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our moderator, Sam Greenberg, who will go on to introduce uh, each, of, uh, each of our panelists in turn. But first, uh, Sam, and this is the highest praise I can give, is sure to be one of our future leaders, a great thinker and a fearless doer, as you'll, you'll see. At only 18, before he started college, Sam noticed the growing number of homeless youth who really had no place to go. Adult shel shelters just don't, don't work for youth. Um, so he co-founded the Y2Y Network in Harvard Square, um, which was the first youth-led homeless uh, shelter in the country. And no surprise, the organization has been uh, incredibly effective, so much so that uh, within a matter of months, a second uh, shelter will open in New Haven. And finally, just to add, name a few of Sam's many honors, He's been um, named to the, the list, uh, Forbes list, 30 under 30, uh, one of the Chronicle of Philanthropy's 15 leaders changing the nonprofit world, an amazing achievement for someone in his mid-20s. And finally, honorable mention for the Boston Globe's Bostonian of the Year. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so Sam, Sam, thank you um, again for moderating and um, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, thank you for your hard work putting today's panel together. I feel so privileged to be able to share this uh, virtual room with um, some of the folks doing the most inspiring work on youth homelessness um, in the United to end. To, I'm sorry to end homelessness here in the United States and around the world. I'm, we're going to pivot um, to one of the United States' leading national nonprofits working, you know, sort of community by community to pull uh, every possible resource into the effort of ending homelessness. So I'll just say that for all of us growing up as like real enthusiasts for the work of homelessness, um, Roseanne Haggerty is kind of a superhero. She's the president and CEO of Community Solutions, which is an internationally re and, and she's an internationally recognized leader in developing innovative strategies to end homelessness. Community solutions assist communities throughout the U.S. and internationally in implementing systems that measurably end homelessness and change the conditions that produce it. Their large-scale initiatives include the 100,000 Homes Campaign and Built for Zero. Before this, Roseanne founded and led Common Ground Community, a pioneer in the development of supportive housing models and other research-based practices that end homelessness. Among numerous awards and honors, Roseanne was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 2001, and as John mentioned in his intro, in absolutely game-changing and much more recent news, Community Solutions received a $100 million grant this past year from the MacArthur Foundation to accelerate its work. 
Rosanna is a graduate of Amherst College and Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture and Planning. We're very lucky to have you here today. Welcome, Rosanna Haggerty. Sam, thank you. And what a delight to be here with uh, this great group on this uh, vital topic. And in fact, to echo others who've spoken, accelerating an end to homelessness, it's not just an aspiration, it's actually happening. Uh, we see the challenge as uh, building on what is already working of the 89 cities, counties, and regions that are part of the Built for Zero initiative. Uh, 44 are now seeing measurable reductions at a population level in homelessness, and 14 have gotten to a standard that uh, defined as functional zero for one or more populations, which means homelessness is measurably rare, uh, uh, quickly flagged when, it's, uh, when it occurs, a new incident occurs, and quickly and, and uh, effectively resolved. And uh, those communities have ended chronic and or veteran homelessness, so we are on our way. And what we've learned is required is, uh, frankly, a new way of thinking and working. Uh, and we came to this insight, quite honestly, through our work over many years. And uh, we started off as housing developers and realized that housing is necessary, but insufficient. Uh, we built about 3,000 units of uh, permanent supportive and affordable housing in New York City and the region. And homelessness continued to increase. And other organizations were, were similarly building lots of new units. But what we discovered, and it was really only through deeply working with people who are living the experience of homelessness on the street, uh, we, we came to see what the missing piece was. And if you could go to the next, uh, we, we came to understand through uh, just in-depth and, and uh, conversations with uh, really neighbors of ours in the Times Square area initially, and then throughout more of Manhattan, that uh, frankly, housing is a verb. You know, it's not just a, 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 a product, it's not just a place. And the process of connecting people to housing who have fallen through our safety net, that there needs to be as much intentionality and accountability there as in providing the units in the first place. Uh, what, we, what we saw, and this is a, a, a basically rendering of a design exercise, we uh, uh, engaged with people experiencing homelessness and organizations working to help them, that uh, the, the, it was basically almost this lethal game of shoots and ladders where None of these steps added up. All, every well-meaning organization had its own rules, its own criteria, and it was no one's job to actually end homelessness in any community. It was everyone working at the program level to implement their program without a view of the whole and what it meant for people who were experiencing homelessness to actually try to navigate their way through this Byzantine process. And so Build for Zero in our work has really been about working with communities who voluntarily step into this space of saying, we have seen the problem and it's the way we're working and we're going to fix that. And we're going to do that through holding ourselves accountable for working as a team and for knowing everyone experiencing homelessness by name. And our, our learning about how one as a community uh, solves a complex shifting dynamic problem like homelessness really came from our looking to other sectors and how complex problems were being solved in other spaces. And John, if you could advance the slide. So much of our learning over the last uh, decade has really come from places like global health and, and manufacturing about how you get the parts of a system to connect and be accountable for a shared result. And what you're looking at is a, a, a picture of a group in Nigeria working on the last mile challenges of eliminating polio in that country. And you see that basically this command center approach, everyone from the, the outreach workers to the, the kind of the global funding representatives in the same space, looking at the same data and planning their next move in response to what's actually true on the ground and how a problem is moving and changing. And it's that way of working that we have come to see makes the difference in ending homelessness. Uh, one of the, the, the key questions that has driven our work and, and really it's been this collective learning process with these uh, Vanguard communities who've stepped up to learn in public what it takes to get to an end to homelessness is that all of us have to continually ask ourselves the question if all of our investments are adding up to the single res you know, a result that we want in every community, which is a reduction in homelessness, not compliance with programs or did the money get spent, you know, but actually is what we're doing working measurably and uh, also to introduce this sense of freedom about you know, using data about what you know, shared data across the, the different organizations who need to collaborate to, to really you know, create a new common language to invite the kind of ongoing iteration and, and uh, uh, speedy changes and tests of new approaches to allow this complex shifting and urgent problem to actually be mastered. Uh, and that what you're looking at here 
is uh, what every community in Built for Zero now has the capacity to do, which is to know in real time by name, both at the individual level and at the system level, at the population level, how the dynamics of homelessness are working, to have a comprehensive view of the issue and to know, you know at, at minimum monthly, but most communities are now looking at this data every day to see what's changing, what, what are we doing that's working, what are the new uh, drivers of homelessness that we need to go upstream and get ahead of, how do we accelerate housing placements, that this whole process is really the game changer we're finding and communities can learn to do this. And in fact, uh, mastering things like data analytics, uh, other tools for collaboration, like quality improvement, uh, 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 facilitating large diverse groups and working as a team, that these are the practices, the methods that actually are needed to solve complex problems like homelessness and are very relevant, frankly, to a lot of the problems that result in homelessness. In addition to that person level data and communities being able to balance their data month over month and make sure they're seeing everyone to a very high degree of, of certainty and comprehensiveness and timeliness, um, they're also looking at how everything is adding up. And this way of visualizing data and allowing a whole team of, made of different organizations from government and not-for-profit entities to really be looking at the same reality, to seeing how it's all adding up, what needs to be changed to enable uh, policy and practice to move at the speed of the issue. These tools are proving so powerful. And, uh, and, and frankly, if we're going to get to uh, uh, the, an end state in at which we absolutely can around an issue that is so urgent from a public health and racial equity challenge, it's really going to be about introducing these tools for accountability and for collective work, not just new resources. And so one of the things that has been, frankly, a, you know, a surprise in this group learning about you know, a group like ours where we started you know, working on, on building housing, which is so essential, and just a, a shout out to Richard and the incredible leadership he's bringing to the federal government at this time of just extraordinary new resources coming into communities. We see that the frame that communities adopt and in, into which they put these resources matters enormously. That you, the, the, the communities that are making progress start with a shared aim. Is everyone at, at, at all of the key government and not-for-profit agencies holding themselves to a single aim, which is reducing homelessness at the population level and measuring progress in the same way? Are they all prepared to and actually functionally working as an integrated team beyond each organization or, or, or government office toward that collective goal? And, and uh, are they learning uh, to actually rely on shared data, a, a picture of reality that they are constructing together and updating regularly to tell them what to do next, whether their collective efforts are working. And then uh, flexible resources, as, as Richard described, we have these unprecedented opportunities now to channel the resources through the American uh, Rescue Plan thoughtfully and, and, and with the intention of result to drive reductions in homelessness. And lastly, one of the benefits of the Built for Zero network and uh, frankly, a forum like this is how do we help uh, accelerate learning from each other? Uh, we now have across our communities, uh, well over 200 uh, case studies of uh, experiments communities have run using their data to uh, make more rapid progress, to uh, remove barriers, to change incentives, and this uh, ability to connect the dots between now 89 communities uh, uh, we see is accelerating everyone's ability to solve this problem uh, in, in a more rapid uh, manner. So I'll end there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roseanne, for giving us that sense of exactly the, the way that you guys do your work, what's important um, in, in your support of communities and, and how uh, you're working every day to um, end homelessness in those communities. It's, it's really inspiring. We're going to zoom in one step further from sort of the systems level uh, work that Community Solutions does. Um, and we're going to um, dive into one particular city, which um, is, uh, a sh in, in my research, uh, a shining example in the effort to prevent and end homelessness. We have so much to learn, I think, um, here in the United States from how other cities and countries around the world have addressed homelessness. And the work that um, New Capital upon Tyne in England has done is truly exemplary. exemplary. Neil Munslow is the service manager for active inclusion for the Newcastle City Council, where he has worked since 1989. Neil is responsible for the coordination and delivery of services in Newcastle that provide the foundations for a stable life, somewhere to live and income, financial inclusion, and employment. Neil chaired the Euro Cities Homelessness Group between 2009 and 2011, 
Newcastle was the government's 2008 regional homelessness champion, in 2009, rough sleeping champion, and an early adopter homelessness prevention trailblazer in 2016. In 2019, Newcastle entered into a partnership with Crisis to seek to be the city that ends homelessness. In 2020, the Newcastle City Council won the World Habitat 2020 Gold Award for their long-term work on homelessness prevention. Uh, I'll just share an incredibly cool fact that I learned from Neil's bio to conclude his intro, which is that Neil was awarded an MBE for services to local government in 2011. I don't, I don't think that quite makes you a knight, but it's definitely close enough for me. So uh, we're so glad to have you, and thanks so much for being here, Neil. Thank you very much. And um, in terms of royalty, obviously following um, Roseanne Haggerty, who's the um, at least the high priestess, if not the queen of homelessness worldwide. So a lot of what we've done in Newcastle has been inspired and influenced. And yeah, it's a real privilege to follow Roseanne, and particularly those words about pulling everything together to work in a framework using data and relating every individual to a wider system and using feedback loops. And what we seek to do in Newcastle is have a systemic citywide approach that, create, that collaborates to bridge the gaps and connect people to work together to end homelessness. As Sam said, we've you know, relative success in Newcastle and we'll talk about relative success and absolute failure as long as one person's sleeping rough, it's one too many. And um, so in 2020, we won the World Habitat Gold Award. And what they recognized was our approach to preventing homelessness has helped over 24,000 households from not becoming homelessness. It's much better to prevent and respond. And what they said was, there are things that others can learn from this project, in particular, linking housing, homelessness, the voluntary sector, social care and welfare, there's no way you can end homelessness unless you make those links. And that's what we've sought to do in Newcastle. And um, it's taken, it didn't just happen. And I think all of us have been on a, a journey over the last 20 years or so. And we started with responding to crisis and then asked ourselves, couldn't we have stopped that crisis? Wasn't it, you know, wasn't there something that we could have done? And we started with a multi-agency approach and then we moved to strengthen those partnerships in the context of austerity, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, and then to more integrated, personalized responses for people rather than just partnership level responses. And finally, yeah, I think those penny dropping moments, sometimes a concept, why not seek to end homelessness? It's not inevitable. It, if something can be designed, it can be undesigned and reconstructed for a different purpose, and that's what we've sought to do. And our aim, and I think a few of the speakers have spoken about the importance of having an aim that people recognize and follow is to make it everyone's business to prevent homelessness, but also financial exclusion and to coordinate support for our residents of the foundations for a stable life, because without the, the stability of a home, you, know, you can't do much else in your life. And that's having somewhere to live, an income, financial inclusion and employment, and you need an actual place to live. You, you know, it's a completely theoretical exercise to talk about ending homelessness without homes. You need an income to access that home. You need financial inclusion to keep it and you need employment to thrive. And at the bottom of that slide, you can see some of the challenges that we faced in a city of 300,000. Over the last 10 years, we've seen the role of the local state grow as the national states has drawn. So we've seen 119 million pounds. This is just in Newcastle. We have, have cuts in welfare benefits. We've seen a 345 million cuts in the, in the council's budget, we've seen that turn into rent arrears and food bank use and some of the things that maybe we've seen is more happening in American cities than in UK cities. And we've seen an increase of residents relying on state support. And we've managed to maintain our low levels of homelessness throughout this. And the framework, I think, Roseanne spoke about having a framework and it's a framework rather than a manual that brings people together rather than a set of instructions because it's the dynamic system that we have to respond to. And what we would say the, yeah, the ingredients that you have for those foundations, you have to have visible political leadership. I think as Richard shown, you know, politicians making a statement of this is our intent, is to know your residents, those people affected, and to review what works and keep on going back and have fairness and resource allocation and feedback loops to build the relationships to bridge the gap between the silos. Again, as Roseanne said, if the parts are competing, 
it's going to be dysfunctional. You have to have a systems approach, particularly that looks to create headroom and information resources and workforce that includes data, structured partnership arrangements, ways for work residents to contribute, a focus on improvement and flexible personally, person centered responses to each individual. Holding slide. So I'm going to give you some examples in the next five minutes. Could spend a day, I'll spend 30 seconds. So sorry, John, a lot of clicking. So the first one, and again, I, I think this echoes what Roseanne was saying. It's a lot on a slide, but it's how to create that common picture, that common purpose, that framework, a culture where everyone's looking to prevent at the earliest opportunity. And we show those relationships, those policy ambitions on. I think the left hand side, those measures on the right hand side, as I'm looking at it, maybe the other way around for you, of a system to sustain people and targeting support where we know people are at risk. Some of those examples of how that's worked, and, and these slides will be shared so people can look in more depth at these things. Yeah, 125,000 visits to the website, 31,466 residents advised in 2021. 4,100 cases of homelessness prevented, and 25 million of additional benefits secured for residents. There's 985 non-emergency admits and support accommodation, but 126 individuals were found sleeping rough, an average of two a day, but each one would have had an offer of something. And if we could click on John, uh, oops, I think there's one back. No. Nope. Yeah, yeah. so this one just shows the resource we've got. You have to have resource, and it's how you create that accountability where supply creates demand. And we have 27,000 council homes, we have 136 dedicated flats, we have 815 emergency rooms. And it's getting those resources pulled together, we have a, a single database that we try to do this through our gateway system to create that coordinated access, but also to identify where we need headroom so we can have a pathway to move people out of emergency homelessness into stability. But the main thing is then to keep them in stability and that's where most of our resources sit. And this, our next aim is to really strengthen the collaboration with health. Health has been a missing part of the jigsaw, health services. It's a national service. And having those three areas, creating a collaborative framework, focusing on prevention, making change happen with clear measures for everyone. I think as Roseanne said, set goals. I oh know, I think it's Richard said, set goals and work with agency to meet those goals. And we have those very clear measures. No one sleeping rough, it should be rare. It, into a home, time in homeless accommodation should be brief and it shouldn't be reoccurring. So in the last year, for our 27,000 council homes, we've had no evictions into homelessness. This next slide shows those structured partnership arrangements by which we bring people together. And you can apply these things to your own local settings. The most important, I think, is having those inclusion plans, which is those personalized housing plans for every individual. So great things are done when a series of small things are brought together, and that creates coherence, it creates a system. And then if you've got a data system that can tie those together, you can see trends, patterns, and identify where to place your resource. This is an example that we worked on with the Design Council. For collective decision-making, compromises, and learning, it's structured responses to move people as quickly and safely as possible through a system for stable housing. So that awareness and assessment, collective decision, and then implementing and reviewing. And those feedback loops all the time to look at what works. And this is about, I think Roseanne mentioned the word accountability a few times, and this co collaborative accountability for financial inclusion. How do these parts work together? What do the various voluntary sector organizations contribute? And we quarterly present this, these figures through visible political leadership and look to create progress all the time. This next is an example of integrated teams to respond to more complex needs. This is for people who are most adversely affected by poverty, of bringing together, making that acronym of a stable life real, bringing together a team that's made up of housing specialists, welfare rights, budgeting, employment, and early help, and working as a single team 
rather than a, a partnership. And he says, click on, please. This is just an example of how that team works together in real life, a complex case, family at risk of homelessness with over 38,000 pounds worth of debt. The team helped them to maximize their income by 11,500 pounds a year. That, alongside a repayment plan with the landlord, meant they kept their home. This is a, you know, it's an intensive work, but it's cheaper than homelessness and more effective than homelessness. This next slide is about our work with health and duplication for personalization. So the people who appear in hostels often appear in accident and emergency wards. How do we better tie our resources together into a single process? And we start with that data and we extend the principles of what we've done to respond to homelessness to meeting the needs of the individuals because a house alone isn't enough when people have got greater needs. In the last quarter, 79 people were found sleeping rough in Newcastle. Those people, most of them had somewhere to live. We found that we provide a drop-in for people to go to. It perpetuates street life. So we're looking at how, if we change that, take that away and focus more on helping people off the street, will that work better? If we, I'm conscious I'm overrunning slightly here. But, uh, an example of good quality accommodation. And the main thing is understanding the motivation of the person. This person wanted to reconnect with their children. That encouraged them to take up the home and then they reconnected with their children. And just got a few pictures to end with, which I hope give some inspiration. Uh, this is our temporary accommodation in Newcastle. It's one of the best buildings well, that we've got, maybe one of the best in the country. This is what a resident said, a place of comfort and kindness. The facilities were not shared. I had the freedom to be alone and collect my mind. My thoughts, the next slide is just a, a chap who, this was our largest hostel. We converted it into self-contained accommodation. And as you can see, he's a much happier place. Lastly, we've got a picture of people living in, um, who've come through the asylum process, the refugees into Newcastle. And I think they capture what we're after. It's safety and stability that made me feel at home and made me feel that I was born again. And I've got the final slide, sorry, that just has some of our next steps forward, some links where you can get additional information. I think a lot of the points there are obvious, so maybe the final point that I'd like to make is if we accept that when we build better, we do better, and that's building systems, building homes, the environment trumps wills. And if we design our systems home, Services and support to end homelessness, not just to respond to crisis, we are more likely to do it. That was a terrific presentation, Neil. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and one thing I really appreciate about the way that you uh, spoke about your work is that you, you know, talked about the, the broad work you do, your commitment to uh, breaking down barriers, having people work together non-competitively, um, you know, moving collectively. But I think sometimes that can feel very abstract. What does that actually mean in the way you gave a specific outcome, specific work that you did, literally specific housing units that you brought on board. So thank you for the work that, that you do and, and thanks for sharing that with us. Um, as our final speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Sean Pleasance, who works day in and day out to address the systems that cause homelessness and to advocate for the unhoused community. A former banker and entrepreneur with an economics degree from Yale, Sean lived unhoused in Los Angeles for 10 years. Currently, Sean is a sought after speaker sharing firsthand experiences and offering advice to effectuate meaningful, sustainable policy changes for the unhoused and the housing insecure residents of Los Angeles County. Recently, he's been the subject of features by CNN and the Los Angeles Times, as well as a speaker on several popular radio and internet programs. Sean seems very busy. He serves on a truly impressive number of boards and advisory committees, including Lafayette, a Bridge Home Advisory Council, St. James Episcopal Church Soup Kitchen Dreaming Council, K-Town for All, the Legal Needs Assessment for People Living with HIV and AIDS Community Advisory Committee, and LA Older Adult System Modeling Stakeholders Group. We're extremely grateful to have you join us today. Welcome, Sean Pleasant. Please take it away. First of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I am greatly appreciative that this room today is full of a lot of hope. Homelessness is a very difficult topic. It's something this nation, this particular nation, has had a very hard time dealing with. And it's finally come to it, I guess, come to a head where we can't ignore it anymore. I'm going to be somewhat radical in some of my uh, comments here. I've got some random thoughts and some comments related to um, uh, what's been said today. Um, but in a city that doesn't walk, I live in Los Angeles, 
we are more concerned with keeping our sidewalks clear than we are with where people live. You may have seen in the news re recently, we've had incidents in Venice Beach and Echo Park. And although they may have had some good results in the end, um, the primary focus was not about the people who were unhoused. It was about the people who were being inconvenienced because their park or their sidewalk was being blocked, once again, in a city where no one walks. And this to me is, it's, it's very disturbing um, because uh, intent is one of the things we got to look at. You know, it's, it's, it's why we do things. It also um, flows through as, into how well we do those things. And so we need, we need to uh, remedy homelessness, not because it's inconvenient to others, but because it makes lives whole again. It recovers people. It, it makes people have potential again. It gives hope. Um, it, it, it gives um, self-esteem back to a, a, a vulnerable, popu vulnerable population um, that has really gone through some tough times. It doesn't matter how they became homeless. They are homeless. And we need to do something about it. You know, we will never solve homelessness until people care enough to do something. You know, I know times are tough, um, but um, unfortunately, uh, people have become, uh, they, they, people have not become selfless and compassionate, which is we need in, what we need in tough times. From where I'm sitting, I feel completely hopeless, uh, hopeless and helpless. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because there, there seem to be some interesting um, things going on in the world to, to help this problem. Um, but uh, as someone who works as an advocate, as someone who does this on a daily basis, um, when someone comes to me and asks for help or tells me that um, their, you know, their friend or their cousin is experiencing homelessness, um, it's a completely new and unique case in each and every situation. Um, there is no, what do you do? Um, Richard earlier spoke on, uh, you know, the help that's been done with veterans. Um, well, that's, 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 that has to do with connection, in my opinion. You've got the, the you know, the Veterans Administration. Um, you know, if, if someone's a veteran and, they're, and they become homeless, they have someone to call. Um, families was the other one that he mentioned. Um, families, you call, you call the Department of Family Services in whatever state you're in. There's a connection, someone to call. If you're an individual, who do you call? No one. I didn't become homeless when I arrived on the street. I became homeless the moment I didn't have enough money to make rent. That's when I really became homeless. And from that, and, and what happens is from that point on, uh, I went through all my resources because you're scrambling. You don't want to end up on the street. So you're spending money as you have to. And, and then, so when you do end up on the street, you're without any resources whatsoever. You have exhausted your financial uh, ability. You've, you've exhausted all of your friends. You've, you've exhausted your family's patience for trying to help you out. It's, it's, it's quite an ordeal. Uh, the, the most immediate, and, and, and uh, I, I apologize, I'm going to be all over the map here, but I uh, just want to give you a little bit of flavor of things. Um, when I first ended up on the street, the first thing I went through was denial. This, is, this isn't really happening to me. I'm not really here. Um, I'm just in the car for a little while. Uh, me and my husband, we'll, we'll find another place. We just haven't landed housing yet. But all the while knowing in the back of my head that it's probably not going to happen. Because um, I knew that I'd already spent my savings. I'd already, already asked all the friends and family that I could to, for help. And you find yourself parking near places and, and folks that you, you're familiar with for safety until you do, until you develop a sense of shame and embarrassment. Then you try to park and stay as far away from them as possible. Unfortunately, people will, will, will term this uh, service resistance and so forth and so on. Um, but, but the last thing you wanna do is bring light to your problem after you reach a certain point. Um, and then you resolve yourself to the fact that you're homeless. For many years, we refused to, to get a tent or anything because that would be admitting to the fact that I am homeless, that I'm, I'm trying to find some comfort in it or make the best of it. And that's not what I wanted to do because in my mind, um, the moment I did that, it was all over. Um, I, I would be there forever. Um, so it, there's a lot of, of, I guess, trauma that goes into it. And, and right now I'm on, I'm on the other side of it. It's, 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 homelessness is, 
and I'm a little emotional at the moment, but think of it this way. In Los Angeles, there are 60,000 people who are homeless um, or, or more. Um, if this had been a natural disaster that had displaced 60,000 people, we would enlist FEMA and all types of emergency uh, funding and, and emergency processes to come out National Guard to, to find these people housing. But because this has happened over a long period of time, there's no response at all. And while it may not be a natural disaster, it's a national disaster. It's a human disaster. The 10 years that I spent on the street, I'll never get back. Um, the damage that's been done to, to me mentally, um, physically, um, you know, when one is, is homeless, there is no health care. The only times I, I intersected with the health care system was when there was an emergency, you know, and, and this may sound funny, but, uh, you know, you hear every day that in Los Angeles, five homeless people die every day. On four different occasions, I was almost that person. Two bouts of pneumonia, bouts of food poisoning, and I was stabbed in the back of the neck with a screwdriver by a total stranger. Those were the only times I came in contact with the healthcare system, plain and simple. Um, that's one area we could use to contact people if there were ways to create outreach with the health with the healthcare. Because, as you also may know from studies that LASA has done, people who live on the street um, experience symptoms, uh, medical symptoms of people who are 20 years their their senior. And uh, you know, I'm I'm a testament to that, and I I'm still plagued with with various problems that I'm going through. And, and, you know, now I see doctors as regular as I can, but we need some way to connect to people, to connect to those people who are not veterans, who are not families, who don't fit in these categories. We see, we see people in homeless encampments. Um, we, we see the tents, we, we count, we think we have a, 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 a handle on it, but do we really know? Um, do you count the people who ride the buses endlessly at night or the Metro at night to stay warm? Um, do you count the people who sit inside of the malls during the daytime to stay cool or in the parks? Not just the people who are under the freeway underpasses, but what about the people on the waterways? Um, what about the families that live in someone's living room? And what about the single people who, who surf on people's couches? Do we count them? I think, th I think we have a much bigger problem than we're aware of. Um, I've been involved in a few homeless counts, and we go out on the street and we count what you can visibly see. But from what I know, there are so many others that don't show up at all. What about the, you know, the, 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 the people who live in, in parking garages? I was one for a while. Um, they don't get counted. None of those people in any of those groups. So I think we really have a much bigger problem than, than, we're, than we are aware of at this point. And I guess what I really want to say, though, is there's, there's a few, there, there's, there's three things in my mind that, that have to take place. We need permit prevention. Number one, we need something that for people to be able to do before they end up in that situation. You know, we, we have all these wonderful renters laws and so forth, but um, I, I still don't understand to this day why, you know, someone could, could rent an apartment for 10 years from the same landlord. And uh, if they're late on the rent one time, they can get a three day unlawful retainer and be on the street within days. Um, meanwhile, that landlord hasn't had to repaint the apartment each year, re-rent it, lose a couple of months, uh, recarpet it and refurnish it, which um, costs thousands of dollars each and every year. And there's no loyalty built into the system at all for people who are renters. They are just, you could be there 20 years, three days and you're out. And I've seen, and, and I see that so often and, and it, it just, it pains me. Um, because it, it, it's, we, we don't have supply, we don't have assessment of who's actually homeless and, and what they need. And then once we do get them into the system, there's usually lack of support. People need more than just a place. It's, it's solving homelessness is not just a, a, a house or apartment or, or somewhere to live, it's healthcare, it's, it's their mental health, it's substance use, substance use disorder health, it's uh, financial health, it's life counseling, it's reconnection uh, or, or re-entry to the communities in which they, they used to live. Um, and I know I'm out of time. Um, I, there's just, I, I, there's, there's a, few, a few things, if you, if you can bear with me, that I would like to point out that were wonderful. You know, I, I love what, what Richard said, you know, it is possible to end homelessness. Uh, and how do we get there faster? You know, that, that's, that's the way we need to be thinking. Um, the, other, the other thing was, 
you know, Roseanne said, acceleration to an end of homelessness is actually happening. And, and I do believe we are, we are getting better at it, but we still have a long way to go. Housing is a verb. And the next one that Roseanne pointed out is one that I encountered at every step of the way in my journey. None of the steps add up to the program, you know, as none of the steps add up. The programs are at odds with one another in a Byzantine process. And that's what I found out. There are a whole bunch of bridges to nowhere. None of the organizations work with one another. Each organization carries out its mandate uh, its own way with re no regard to how its neighboring organizations are doing the same. And I don't know about other parts of the country, but, but in Los Angeles, things are done by spa districts. And so there's only a particular uh, organization allows you to do outreach in a certain area and none of these things overlap, but they're all completely different and they're self-serving, but they don't work in the interest of the actual homeless person. I tried eight times before I was able to actually find housing. Um, and, and trust me, I tried hard. Um, and it was always because of some fumbling of the ball. Whenever there's a handoff between agencies, there's always a fumble. That's been my experience. And with that, I'm going to back off here. And, and, and uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, Neil, um, one of the things, you know, that you had, you had mentioned, um, uh, it's much better to prevent than to respond. Um, without the stability of, of having a home, you can't do much else. And, and that's, that's the crux of it right there. And with that, I'll get off my soapbox and turn it back over to the moderator. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Thank you for um, for 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 sharing. And and I think um, you know some of the things that you brought up that I, I really want to highlight are some of the barriers to systems. This you know the game of shoots and ladders, as as Roseanne described, and how how like you know you you talked about this as well. Like these are people's lives. People, you know, so every time somebody you know gets dropped in in a, in a in a referral, like that is that is a day ruined at best, right? And and I, I really appreciate you bringing that. I also appreciate you highlighting. Um, the specific uh, uh, responses you'd like to see, and 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 finally, just talking about um, you know th this idea that um, we're often more concerned with keeping our sidewalks clear than with where people live. We're going to come back to each of those items, but thank you so much for for sharing your experience and also um, your your expertise and, and what you have um, what what you've sort of um, pulled together as recommendations. So so really appreciate that. Um, we have about twenty five minutes. I see probably about twenty minutes for discussion. And I'm really looking forward to diving in with all four of our amazing panelists. Um, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to ask some questions. Some of them are going to be from the audience. Some of them I prepared. I'm going to direct them to one of you, um, maybe two of you. And then if anybody else wants to jump in, don't, don't be shy. Please feel free. Um, I want to start with um, this question. You know, th This panel is about bringing an end to homelessness, accelerating the end to homelessness. One thing I'm really curious about is, at least here in the United States, you know, our policy paradigm shifted with the onset of COVID-19. Um, the, the, the public health crisis that it that it represented, the urgent specific need, kind of reminds me of what Sean was talking about. If there was a you know a natural disaster and 60,000 people became homeless at once, our systems moved more quickly. In Connecticut, I know that we put folks in hotels, we opened outdoor drop-in centers. I know that in California, people were able to uh, get shelter in hotels there. Uh, eviction moratoriums of lots of different kinds were implemented. Um, uh, Richard spoke briefly about the American Rescue Plan and, and the way that dollars were freed up that could truly be game-changing. That's amazing, right? That's incredible and, and a huge testament to, our, to the leadership that made that happen. I think it also put in starker relief the fact that um, I, it, it makes me wonder, you know, whether we could do this all the time, whether we could treat homelessness like an emergency all the time. And and, and I, I think I probably share that sentiment with all of our panelists. Um, I, I wanted to start by asking if there is one policy change that you saw implemented or at least discussed in response to COVID-19 that you really would have liked or would like to see made permanent. So one thing that was implemented or talked about in response to COVID-19 that you really like to see. I would just absolutely underscore Richard's point about the linkage between public health and homelessness and that this, if homelessness is understood as a public health problem, it all changes because you have that kind of accountability. You know you're in a world, uh, look at our response to COVID where you're, you're looking at population level uh, trends, you're looking at what's working, your data is telling you, 
you know, what, what interventions uh, are needed next. And so not only the linkage uh, with public health, but what I think we've collectively learned about how you keep a population safe, you know, that that is so relevant to homelessness and uh, those practices around collaboration data and the linkage with public health uh, really are, are, are potentially game-changing if we can carry them forward. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, I feel like I have to hold up my post-it note that says public health. Um, but yeah, and I suppose one of the, because it kind of relates to what Sean said about the sidewalk, you know, the public health issue is that homelessness starts to affect everybody else. And so in the UK, we had everyone in because if people are on the street, they're more likely to be a risk to other people's health. And at the height of the pandemic here, um, moves into settled housing, you know, somewhere where you've got all of your own facilities, not just a shelter, were banned, unless it was for an emergency. And in Newcastle, a colleague of mine established an emergency housing panel. And that created the integration to move people a lot more quickly on. I think you know, Sean's point about the um, dropping the ball, you know, and I think Roseanne's talked about the problem of homelessness as a hot potato, people pass it around rather than seek to solve the problem. So for us, the manifestation that worked was, and we kept it going, and that was a very busy slide I sent with the Design Council, illustration of having a complex case housing panel whose job is to integrate responses so that people get somewhere to live, but they also get the support they need to sustain that place. Thank you, Neil Sean. Um, our, co our COVID-19 response um, did a couple of things. It offered inclusion to uh, a vulnerable and often left out uh, population. It, it let them know that um, their health was important, not, and it let the rest of the world know that um, um, everyone's health, it is a public health issue, was important. Now, there were some lost opportunities there, um, particularly in, in California. We had uh, programs like Project Room Key and, and, and others where homeless people were put into hotels during the, most of the pandemic. But during that time, no work was done at reestablishing their lives. No, work was no real work was done in helping them find permanent housing or having regular medical appointments for other issues. Uh, COVID's not the only problem. Uh, m mental health issues. This was a perfect opportunity. We had a captive audience. We knew where they were every day. We could have we we could have brought help to, uh, healthcare to them uh, because one of the hardest problems when you're on the street is you can't get anywhere or or you call like several times when I called it called the, an ambulance when I had uh, pneumonia. They don't come or they come and they and they don't take you. We need to try to take advantage of those opportunities when we do have um, uh, the ability. To, to affect change, and I, I think that's 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 unfortunate, um, but but I am thankful that um, uh, for the inclusion. I'm thankful for the that that uh, the safety of that population was looked after. Great, thank you. And and I actually um, for our next question, I'm, I'm going to bring in a question from the audience, um, uh, partially inspired by again the quote that's really stuck with me that Sean said that we're more concerned with keeping our sidewalks clear than with where people live. The the, somebody from the audience, and it's been the, the most upvoted of our of our questions, uh, talked about how more and more private developers now own and operate public spaces, and in particular commented on the hostile architecture to displace the homeless. Uh, this exclusionary design makes the homeless even more vulnerable. Is is uh, what the question said. This is of course a panel or a, a panel organized by the Graduate School of Design, and and I'll just say I, I was in Denver for the first time uh, about a month ago, and. There was this one place in this very trendy sort of uh, uh, neighborhood with a lot of breweries and also with some social services that had big rocks on the sidewalk where there had been encampments sort of right around it. And, and they were not naturally occurring rocks. They were placed there, uh, I think, to prevent um, tent encampments. And, and I'm not just picking on Denver. I've seen uh, that there's, there's uh, uh, you know, um, anti-homeless architecture in, in, in a lot of places. Um, Sean, I'd love to go to you first since you commented on this specifically. and. Um, uh, and then, and then, if anybody else wants to comment, um, what should we learn about um, the, the this kind of um, uh, uh, exclusionary or anti-homeless architecture? Um, and and what what should we say about that? Whew, that that's a, a big question. Um, this the, it's it's really uh, I, I I think an issue of fear 
Um, we're, we're human beings at, 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 the, at the root level. And, and, you know, people see homeless encampments, they see other homelessness, and for whatever reason, perhaps they, they see themselves in it and, and realize they're one paycheck away from it. Um, perhaps they think it's something you can catch, uh, but they don't want to see it. Um, it, it, it reminds them of what's wrong with their communities. It reminds them of, of what shouldn't be there. So they want it somewhere else. Um, some places use um, architecture like that to, 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 to keep them from people from being around. I've even been told by security guards uh, and I, what the hell is true, uh, McDonald's and, and outside of one. And, and uh, they, they told people, don't give the homeless anything because they're like birds. <laughs> they're talking about people here and uh, uh, you know we we have a city which is full of ordinances that keep people from 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 being around so instead of building architecture um, we have anti-camping laws so so if you're on a sidewalk if you're on a bench for more than half an hour or something or if you sleep um, you're considered to be camping and you're not allowed to camp anywhere in, in, in city limits or county limits um, that's how it's handled here which is still it, it's awful because where are they supposed to be Maybe Sam, I'll just add one thing. Uh, you know, reinforcing the um, you know, the, the consequences uh, on, on human beings who are already traumatized and in crisis of of these sort of extraordinary and costly measures, and just to highlight how counterproductive and absurd it is from a, a, a you know a municipal standpoint. Um, as as Neil said, one person experiencing homelessness is too many. But we tend to lose sight of the fact that, at least in the United States, uh, this is totally within the zone of solvability. Uh, that in no one community is the rate of homelessness, even in places as as uh, that are as challenging as Los Angeles, is the rate of homelessness more than a fraction of one percent of the population. This is completely a last mile problem, and yet. You know, we're 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 spending money and energy on fake rocks. You know that that have this, you know, additional, um, uh, you know, kind of disrespect and shaming effect on people who are struggling to get back on their feet. You know, it it makes absolutely no sense to be spending energy and resources on anything other than solving the problem. That's so important, Roseanne, and and I actually it, it prompts me, I, Neil, if it's okay to ask. You talked about the fiscal austerity that Newcastle has been under. There is financial pressure on you. I'm wondering, and, and on your leadership, how, how did you guys, uh, how have you, I hope it sounds like successfully, um, told the story of why it's so important to support people experiencing homelessness and, and you know, not let the, the, uh, a scarcity of resources um, create, and, and I don't know if this is an issue or not, but sort of the, the kind of stigma that, that Richard spoke about, that everybody's spoken about. How, how do you try to kind of keep that message toward focusing on, on what works and, um, and, and continuing to allocate resources toward people experiencing homelessness during a time of austerity and scarcity? Yeah, so that comes from political leadership. You know, we've got uh, our elected politicians believe that everyone matters. Um, the life for everybody in the city is worse if it's in trauma, but there's also a simple financial um, response as well that responding to unsolved crisis and only responding to unsolved crisis costs a lot more. You know, we as a city haven't had to use, because there's a statutory duty to respond to what gets called priority homelessness in, in, in England. and um, we haven't used bed and breakfast accommodation, which costs a lot of money to, to meet that need. Other cities um, in similar situations with proportionately same housing stock, second biggest city, um, 6,000 children in temporary accommodation at the same time, and they were all over the country. We have 37. There's a huge cost in that kind of crisis-based response. There's a cost in prevention, and it's having the confidence to try and align your resources to your problem. And that takes, and we're fortunate to have great political leadership in Newcastle. That's really important. So I feel like the, the prevention piece you spoke about, it is just more effective, more humane, more cost-effective to prevent people from 
falling into homelessness, right? It's better for everyone. And then the brave political leadership that you spoke about, that feels so important. And, and I, I'm struck at how uh, much that's something that, uh, you know, I think probably every city, certainly in the United States, uh, many there are many brave political leaders, and I think we could all use an extra dose of that as we work to address homelessness. Um, I'm going to pivot us to our last question, and then before our closing statement, um, I want to ask each of you, um, if I give you like a magic wand and you had one wave of it, and it could uh, make one change around uh, homelessness, and it can be from whatever vantage point. It could be funding, it could be system, it could be to remove a barrier that you feel is uh, in the way. It could be a change in attitude. Um, it's a hard question, um, but if you could wave that wand one time, what would it be? What would that change be to bring about an end to homelessness? Um, I hope it's okay. I'm going to go in reverse order if we spoke. So, Sean, I hope I'm not throwing you too uh, too big of a question right away. But if if you don't mind, I'd love to, if you could take it away. Oh, yes, it is a large question. Um, the thing I would change is I'd make, I, I would make it so that people actually care and realize that those who are homeless or unhoused are somebody's brother, someone's sister, someone's mother, someone's grandparent, someone's uncle, someone's friend, someone's neighbor. They're not just strangers. They're not random people. They're other people in your neighborhood. And if we just cared, I'm sure we could come up with a solution. Um, I was fortunate someone cared and they asked me what I needed. They didn't tell me what they had. They didn't tell me what I should do. They didn't tell me what they might, or they asked me what I needed. And that was different. And that was the, that was the thing that worked and happened. Sometimes it's that simple. Just that little conversation gave me trust to follow them and to, to, to try to find a way out. And, 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 like I said, just by the, the way it was approached, instead of someone handing me, telling me this is what I got, the question is what I need. And each and every person is, is unique and has a unique set of, of, of circumstances, a unique set of needs, uh, abilities, and, and, and we, have to, we have to look at it that way. So I, I think we need to care and that, that will bring hope back. And once there's hope, um, it, it's, it's, it's all possible. Um, I was this close to losing hope, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and I'm so glad I didn't. And, and um, I'm, I'm beyond thankful um, for all those who helped me in my situation. Yes, it's unfortunate. There's 10 years of my life I can't bring back, but there's a whole lot of other people I can help. And that's the way I see it, you know. So I'm going to try to take my misfortune and, and try to make someone else's life better. It's been a tough process as, as someone who's still recovering and, and, and uh, still putting their life back together. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on government uh, assistance and they make it extremely difficult to be able to help people. Let me tell you, just the, the, the small amount of work that I do do uh, in this arena causes me major headaches and heartaches with my benefits and my situ living situation. Um, if only I could do more, I would. Um, and, and like I said, just care people. That's all we need to do. Just care. You don't have to have an answer. I, I, I don't know what the answer or solution is to homelessness, but I care about it and I care enough to try to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and, and just I, I, one, that was all brilliant. And, and one thing just that it's so important is asking people what they need. It sounds so simple. And yet uh, I think that that's something we could probably all agree is uh, we, we could, we could do a bit more of. Um, Neil? Yeah. Both um, it has made people care because some people care, some people don't. And care alone, you, know, you can't live in care. You need someone to live. So a, a statutory right, a legally enforceable statutory right to a suitable and sustainable home, yeah, that would make people care. And it would change things. And the statutory rights, I mean, you know, to bear arms, I guess, is the one that we would sort of sneer at in, um, you know, about America. You know, things are legally enforceable, and when they become legally enforceable, they happen. Thank you. R Roseanne? We should expect results as the result of our uh, public spending and philanthropic spending and, and dollars. And I think uh, this idea of um, local accountability and uh, even procurement that follows on like, what's the outcome we're all seeking? So um, that, that expectation of result is 
something every citizen can participate in enforcing uh, and uh, seeing that um, you know, we are designing our, our responses to homelessness to actually eliminate the problem rather than uh, endlessly torture people at great cost. But, but just a couple of things I'll highlight in closing. Um, the SPARK initiative, which was a 2018 national analysis of race and homelessness out of the Center for Social Innovation found that 64% of people who experienced homelessness were black compared to 12.4% of the general population and 78.3% were people of color. And that does not be ex that is not explained by poverty. It, it, that, that is still a very outsized role if you control for poverty. And, and so I, I appreciate you naming it. And, and I, I agree that it's, it's, it's something we didn't get to enough in this panel. Um, and, and, and so I, I, I greatly appreciate you raising that. Um, I'll just say before I pass it back to John, um, uh, a, a few themes that I heard from the four of you that I really want to lift up. Um, uh, the first is this question of prevention. It's so fundamentally important if we can uh, figure out how to stem, how to, how to address the systems that have failed to cause people to experience homelessness, we will all be in a better place. It's better for those folks. It is cheaper. Um, it is it is a it is a better outcome, and it's and it's a lot uh, and and it's a lot harder to support people in um, uh, becoming housed once they're homeless. And yet, we do have some amazing innovations and models that work. Roseanne, Richard, Neil, and Sean all spoke about some critically important ways that we out, we know work. We can uh, do these. They they work. They they work for people in terms of uh, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, the housing first approach. And yet we don't fund them well enough. Richard, I was so struck by the stat, said that for every seven individuals experience who could qualify for a voucher, only one, there's only one funded housing intervention in the United States. That's not enough. And I, uh, I, I think we all probably applaud the work that uh, the current HUD administration is doing, and we all know there needs to be more. Um, and finally, I, I just love the point that, that a lot of us hit on that um, we just, I think we all could work on building care and, and empathy and compassion that, that, you know, these, that, that every single person experiencing homelessness is too many. I love that, that Neil said, and, and that, that, that every single person is, is a person and it doesn't, they're, they're not relevant because they inconvenience other people. That's not the point. They're relevant because they, they are people. And, and so I just, um, I, I can't applaud, um, Sean, you for saying that and, and Neil, Roseanne and Richard as well. Um, I, I feel incredibly inspired. This was such a special group. I, I can't thank you all enough for your work that you do every day. Um, for joining us today, spending time with us and sharing um, your your wisdom and your um, your your passion um, with everybody in this uh, in this virtual room. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to John for uh, to wrap us up and transition to the next panel. Well, that was that that was amazing, and um, and thank you so much, uh, Sam and Sean, Richard, Roseanne, and Neil, for sharing your vast amount of of knowledge and uh, your inspiring commitment. I mean. Um, Care really is, in large part, the issue, and and you are all um, the high high priestesses and priests of, of care, um, and and set an amazing example. Um, and if only all if only all of us would just do, um, you know, a, a fraction of what you do, you've dedicated your life to this, um, that would make the difference. So thank you again, and um, and the other things you make it look so easy, um, but we know that you, you're you know, participating in an event like this, preparing for it, getting here on time. It's a big commitment of, of, of that valuable time. And so we're, we're truly, truly honored to have all of you here. Um, so thank you. Thank you once again.